viewers welcome to tv metro mail you are watching chit chat and i am imam ul haq march 26 marks 50 years since uh, we started our liberation the nine months liberation war led to independence independence of bangladesh i am very privileged and very pleased to have my today's guest i have two very special guests with me today on our studio so they will share their stories they will share stories related to our liberation war in 1971 so uh, let me introduce my guest uh, uh, i can see let me bring my first guest on screen here is elizabeth uh, mowling thank you very much for joining us elizabeth uh, um, mowling is a teacher former teacher and a psychotherapist starting in 1971 for about 7 uh, years elizabeth mowling worked with uh, other adopted parents in international adoption she was in her 20s she taught high school for 11 years and after that for 25 years she was a psychotherapist in 1971 she and her husband adopted a little girl who was considered hard to place because she had a trinidadian mother and irish father In 1972 she and some adoptive parents took a trip to Bangladesh who wanted to adopt babies who were fathered by enemy soldiers after that she adopted a little girl from Vietnam whose father was an american soldier and a little boy from Haiti who was extremely malnourished all the families in their group were specially interested in adoptive hard to place children including disabled children she thinks that was the most interesting exciting and rewarding time for her as a parent she has a great experience in raising a child born in bangladesh during the liberation war uh, elizabeth thank you very much for joining us here today you're welcome uh, our next guest let me just bring him on camera as well uh, we have here uh, mustafa choudhry a Bangladeshi origin Canadian and who has graduate degrees in English literature library and information science and Canadian history during his lengthy career of 34 years in Canada's federal public services he worked for a number of federal departments Choudhury is the recipient of several awards for his uh, uh, contribution to the public service and to his profession He has authored three books. Ekatture Juddho Shishu Abidito Itihash. The second was is picking up the pieces. 1971 War Babies Odyssey from Bangladesh to uh, Canada, and the third one is Unconditional Love Story of Adoption of uh, 1970 War Babies. Um, thank you both of you for joining us here today. we will hear from you we'll try to hear your stories today Thank but you. Uh, uh, but you are most welcome but before going into that let us start with this show uh, let us see a, a video clip that we have here then we'll uh, go into other issues how i got here In June 1972 you went to the capital city Dhaka in Bangladesh with some friends This was going to be her second time to adopt a child. Laura was the first to be adopted. Like any other country, Bangladesh had laws about adoption. But my mom had other ideas about adoption. She was invited to supper at the ambassador's house. My mom talked about the laws of adoption. The one law that was standing in my mother's way was that only relatives could adopt the child. You were very lucky. that the ambassador changed the law so my mom could adopt 16 kids for other families that wanted children you wanted to adopt me but you knew that you should only adopt kids that were sick i call myself a lucky kid for two reasons well one is that i was in one of mother teresa's orphanage homes and my future mom came back and saw i was sick so she adopted me right away On the plane, almost all the babies got sick. You know, news travels very fast. 
Prime Minister Trudeau sent a letter saying congratulations. And that's how I got here. I think I'm pretty lucky to be adopted and brought to Canada. I get a lot of choices and I know my mom loves me a lot. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, do you like to revisit those days after watching this video clip? Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed going back and going through all the pictures. And I sent them all to O'Neill and he said they brought back very warm memories, you know, his growing up pictures. So that was very positive. Yeah. So do, do you like to say some, you know, background those because we had uh, in that video clip, there are a number of pictures that he is O'Neill is growing up. Yeah. So uh, let me just show, you know, those pictures. If you like to say something about those pictures, that, that would be great. Like, uh, say, for example, this one. Oh, so, yeah. That, that was one of, one of his first ones after he started to gain weight. Because he, when he was five weeks old, he, was, um, he didn't weigh very much. He was like a little skeleton baby. When we got him back to Canada, we understood that he could not handle the milk formula. So okay. he had to have soya milk. And as soon as he got on the soya milk, he started to look like this. It was like a whole different transformation. It was wonderful. Okay. And then again, we have something, you know, here. So another... <laughs> <laughs> well, there you can see that he has unusual eyes. And at that age, he was seeing things that you cannot see with your eyes. For example, he loved um, going through the car wash. All the kids did. You know, you sit in the car and all these jets of water shoot in at the windows and they'd laugh and they, they thought it was exciting. So we went to the car wash, but it was closed. Then we went to get some groceries and he said to me, Mom, let's go back to the car wash. I said, we, we were there, but it was closed. He says, it's open now. So we went back there and it was open now. And another time, I went to the airport with him to pick up my husband late at night because he was flying in from Toronto to Montreal, yeah. where we live. Yeah. Yeah. And the, he didn't arrive. The, the plane landed, but he wasn't there. <laughs> so O'Neill said to me, Mom, I can see him sitting in his office in Toronto. Okay. So we drove home, we phoned him, and sure enough, he was in his office in Toronto. Wow. So at, before age five, it, it's not that rare for kids to have those kinds of experiences, you know, and he definitely had that. He had that more than the other kids. Oh, that's great. That's great. So let us see. If, uh, yeah. There's another photograph. Yeah. Yeah. This so is helpful. It is when I think probably you just got him from yeah, Bangladesh. At, I think it was at the airport. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's the airport, and again, uh, I think there is another lovely picture here. Yeah, <laughs> he's still he still got that look that he can see things, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. He he was a pretty happy kid. Yeah, yeah. We can see that. I think he he did some other stuff as as a extracurricular activities. Oh, probably he, lo he loved martial arts. That that was a for years and years he practiced that. Mm, okay, and it it's uh, it seems that he also loves uh, fishing. I can see some oh, picture my. here. <laughs> the the first fish he brought home. I think he was even younger than this one. Yeah. Um, there was a neighbor at the next cottage where we would go in the summer who was teaching him. And again, they would kind of sense where the fish were, you know, and he, he was really good at, this is without any kind of uh, motorized thing, because this is way back in the early 70s, right? Right, right, and right. Would, he would kind of have a sense where they were, and so did the fellow who was teaching him. They were both like that. So he'd come home with these enormous fish, and the other fishermen in other cottages, they would all be amazed. They would go, wow, because they didn't catch such big fish. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. No, I mean, his whole life, he's lived, he still does. He lives for fishing yeah. in the summer. I, I believe he was also involved in uh, scouting. I can see one, I don't know whether it's scouting, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, he enjoyed he, all that. 
yeah he is enjoying that uh, quite well and so would you like to you know remember that uh, photograph that who yeah. are there and what are they doing yeah that's a birthday party for o'neil in our kitchen and oh, okay. those, those are the neighborhood kids we're in a little village here and they all grew up together and they all went to the same school and i put that picture in to show that that he had no problem with kids of a different race you know yeah. and his his brother's in the background he's that's the, his older brother from haiti okay 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 great great thank you very much uh, oh, yeah thank you very much elizabeth so we just try to you know show you a number of photographs that reminds you revisit uh, given you a chance to revisit those days yeah so I, i have i have something else that i was remembering yeah we did adoptions in, in other countries and in bangladesh it was the only country where nobody took advantage of us financially so so there was no extra charges for the paperwork you know and people worked with us people were very happy to work with us at, from the government level and every level and of course mother teresa's home it, it was like angels there but when we did adoptions from other countries and i don't really want to name them uh in one country they said oh we've lost their passports but if you give us 50 dollars per child we'll find them again and then in, in oh. other countries they, they got lawyers involved and the lawyers started charging 1500 dollars per child Wow. to do the paperwork because they figured okay we can get away with it you know because these people really want the child from this orphanage so in bangladesh i wanted to point that out none of that happened <laughs> thank you thank you very much thank you very much for sharing that stories and good yeah. to know that you know bangladesh treated you quite well during yes, that time did. yeah and and again thank you very much that you know you also have accepted a child who really needs a mother and you have given the love and affection of mother to him throughout mm -hmm. his life mm -hmm. we learned that you made a trip to bangladesh during uh, after liberation war immediate yeah. after liberation war so you have shared one of your experience about the adoption process so what else you have seen or observed during that time because that time the uh, you know we just uh, newly born independent nation so what is what was your yeah. observation yeah see i I I never got involved in any kind of politics. I was always uh taking rickshaws with my two friends the orphanage that was run by Mother Teresa and we looked at all the babies and there was one baby that was older than O'Neil who was always crying, just crying, crying, crying and I and and they said uh we don't know but and I said can we can we look get him looked after so he ended up I I I held him for days and days and he didn't seem to get any better anyway we took him to the hospital so he died and um uh, he oh. died a little while later yeah. he died so that was that was the real wake up call you know about how how dangerous it was to be a young baby in at that time even in a beautiful orphanage you know the the women and the people there were wonderful but they didn't have the medicine they didn't have doctors you know so that oh, was yeah. uh, that was a bit rough but i also had a, a good a funny story we we went for dinner at the Canadian ambassador sister's house, right? That was the or the consul I think from Bangladesh to Canada. Yeah. He he helped us as well when we got ready and he told us we could go and meet his sister and then she invited us for a dinner party. So we all went out and bought saris so we would look appropriate for this fancy dinner party. And then the daughter of the hostess came to me and said very quietly in my ear that i was wearing my sari inside out <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so yeah. i went i went quickly changed and then i was fine but i thought that was kind of funny okay okay thank you very much elizabeth so uh, uh, we also learned that you know you made a trip with your other colleagues or friends together it was a group you know how did you yes. you know meet them or what was the purpose of visiting bangladesh and or what has inspired you to go to bangladesh we were already um a group of people who knew each other who were all interested in adopting and especially adopting hard to place children because we wanted to to give them homes because they might not otherwise get homes right it seemed more urgent to take these kids and plus it was it was much more interesting to do that <laughs> yeah yeah definitely so yeah so then we heard and i can't remember who it was that first told us about these babies 
yeah. that were fathered by soldiers. I have I have an assumption that everywhere where there are soldiers, there are babies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that they had a, would have a very hard time finding homes within Bangladesh because of the war. So then um, we just started talking to government people. The federal government in Canada, they couldn't have been nicer. They could not have helped us more. When we talked about it, they went, wow, that's a great idea. You know, they were really, really behind us. Okay. That, thank you very much. That's good to know that, you know, that the, you got full support from the Canadian government. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. We'll come to those issues a little more. But let me just go back to uh, Mr. Mustafa. He is also with us. Uh, Mr. Mustafa, let me bring him back. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Mustafa Choudhury, thank you very much again for joining us here. And we have uh, got some experience or stories from Elizabeth. And thank you very much for connecting us with Elizabeth because you are working on war, war children or war babies in Bangladesh. So, what is your inspiration? Uh, how did you get the idea of working uh, with or working for the you know, war babies? Of uh, it's, it's, it, thank you for having me today uh, and Elizabeth as well. Yes, it's, it's a long story. I was working for the Federal Department Heritage Canada, where I was responsible for a file on children of mixed marriage. You know, there was parents could be um, white or black or brown and their children who would be different um, about their identity. And while doing that, I ran into a document which indicated that their babies were born in Bangladesh and adopted in 1972. So I went back and looked at it and I found out that there were babies. And then I took a lot of interest and I started to write. Uh, I wrote a few articles in one of the Bengali newspapers in Toronto, Desha Bideshe. I sat down with the with the editor Mintu and we talked about the war baby in order to find out what it is called in Bengali. So we decided that we would call them Juttoshishu. And I started to write and um, gained quite a bit of popularity and interest. And I started to write. And then people suggested that I should do a, a book. At that time, I was desperately looking for people like uh, uh, like Liz Moling, who was one of the parents. And I was able to connect with them and they cooperated. And with their help, I was able to to write a story on them and I met to all of the war babies and they were very helpful and cooperative so I was uh, fortunate that I was able to get through the, the task and write a book. It was very sensitive. Uh, I remember the sandwich that uh, Liz made for me when I went to her place and we had uh, spent a, a great deal of time together just to find out about it and then I talked to Anil several times. No, thank you very much. And the book you have written, I have that book in front of me. I can show this book to our you know, audience, as those uh, who can read and write bang Bangla. So that's a very interesting book, in fact. So I would like to ask you that uh, how did you capture these stories, facts, figures, because the human stories? Because uh, from uh, you know, the back home, I mean the Bangladeshi perspective, it is quite sensitive. It is, there is a taboo attached, stigma attached to that. So did you find any difficulties during that process while you are collecting informations or facts or figures? Yes, it is. It's very difficult. There is no material. There will not be any material, obviously, for reasons. Uh, 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 most of the documentary evidence that actually emanated from Bangladesh, but they're not available. They're available in Canada, in, Sweden, in Geneva, and the United Nations, um, U.S. So I went to the archives. And I went in, I was in touch with Dr. Jeff Davis, who worked for International Planned Parenthood Federation and was in Bangladesh in 1972 at the invitation of Bangabandhu. So I met him in Australia and some got materials. And most of the materials are from the Canadian archives. It's very interesting to know that most of the parents, like Liz, who, who adopted, they were in touch with the government and there are documents available, but these documents are not available in Bangladesh archives. So I was able to collect them and go through them. So it's very difficult. There's two sets. One is documentary evidence, one in the actual war babies and adoptive parents like Liz. Uh, so I, I have their testimonies and the documents that International uh, Social Service, that is the organization that was invited to come in and look at it and give recommendations. And they recommended that the war babies should be adopted outside of Canada because outside of Bangladesh, because 
they are not accepted. Because if you look at the newspapers of the day, they were really, really, uh, they used derogatory terms. They used them as unwanted children. You know, that's how they were categorized. So it's, there's a lot of stigma attached to it. Uh, and they are being abandoned right and left. Um, so that's why there is not much document. But if you, if you go to the archives in foreign countries, you find those documentations. And I got from the adoptive parents. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chaudhary. So I would like to come to uh, Elizabeth again. So uh, would you mind uh, showing you again a few more, you know, images that will help you to, you know, revisit those days? Sure. Uh, I can see. I have few more uh, in our archive. Here is O'Neill. Teenager. Teenager. <laughs> yeah. So we can we can understand that the teenager. He is, uh, yeah, that time he was in the school, right? Yes. Yeah, we have a, we're in a small uh, heritage village here, and that was our hall, which, yeah. which, uh, where they had dances. So he's yeah. at the door of the dance hall there. <laughs> and, and you have got very sharp memories. You can just remember everything, you know, it's very good. So there's another image here. Yeah, yeah, he loved, he loved all the sports. Yeah, and he enjoyed everything like skiing, everything, but especially the uh, martial arts. That was the big one: martial arts and fishing. Yeah, Those I think at the top of the list. Yeah, I think I can see that the fishing here again. That, that that was, was, yeah, that was his actual caught. caught. He caught that fish. I don't know oh. if he was five or six, but oh. that fish. That was his first fish. Wow! 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 I know, incredible. Isn't yeah, that? it's incredible. That's right. Okay. As well, I can see him. Yeah. Probably he is. Uh... If I can interrupt. Yeah, 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 please go ahead. This is the picture that I took actually. I, uh, I was, uh, I invited him to come to see me. We went for dinner. Prior to that, he came to the hotel where I was staying. It was a hotel in downtown. Yeah. And I, I do remember there was mid 90s. Okay. So I, okay. I took okay. a picture of him. And okay. then we went for dinner. We went to downtown, uh, no, Danforth, Bengali Indian neighborhood, yeah, okay. um, where we had dinner and we had discussions. I would share with you some of the stuff that I talked to him about and how frankly he was talking to me about okay. uh, the time that he was, he was being raised, and okay. how he looked upon himself as being different, and yet he's a part of that family. Mm, that's right, that's right. We'll come to that. So there is a few more images here. I can see the whole family probably. Yeah, that's my second husband. Yeah. His name is John. We've been together 36 years. Okay. And O'Neill has a flat top haircut, as you can see. <laughs> yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my, my oldest son, Panu, is not in the picture. The yeah. girl in the back next to my um, daughter from Vietnam, that's a cousin mm. of ours. Okay, 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 great. And probably this is the most uh, latest uh, image we have uh, of O'Neill. Yes. yes. So uh, I think he is celebrating somebody's birthday. I don't know whether it's uh, his birthday or. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's him. <laughs> it's his. Oh, great, great. Yeah. yeah. 41, maybe? 41 or something? No, 47. 47. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's very recent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, since he was born in 72. So okay, okay, okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think those are the images we have. So we try to share those with our audience, viewers. So, how so you said that, you know, you were, uh, with regard to the adoption process, uh, you were treated quite well in Bangladesh. And you said that you got the, you know, support from the Canadian government at, at that time. Yes, very so, much. Yeah, so definitely, definitely that good to know that. So did you face any difficulties like from the community, friends, family, or what has been your experience with regard to your neighbors? When we um, brought O'Neill home to uh, Montreal, we were living there at the time, mm -hmm. I was surprised by the positive responses from our, our neighbors and the, the ones with the young kids. There was one time when he was riding his tricycle on the sidewalk and he came home and he said some kid had walked past him and said, oh, look, there's a little packy. But um, he was kind of curious more than anything. But he, he knew the tone wasn't nice. But 99% of the time, very, very positive. 
you raised uh, a lovely child you know so yeah. He, yeah. when he was uh, you know adolescent you know so what was were the yeah. yeah so what were the challenges you uh, you know faced or whether he gave you some, any difficult time or not so how was it you know what i don't remember any challenges or physical difficulty times with him i had yeah. i had some with two of the other kids but um O'Neill was, uh, he was sensible, he worked hard, you know, he did all his activities. Um, I don't think so, nothing. Well, that's great. As you said that he was too young when he was born in Bangladesh, only five weeks. Yeah. So he doesn't have any memory or any cultural, you know, uh, attachment there. No, no. So I, I, all my kids were brown. So I taught them as soon as they could understand, maybe four or five, that the amount of melanin in their skin really, it, it was like hair color or eye color. It's not a big deal, you know, and some people make a big deal. But they shouldn't make a big deal because it doesn't matter. What matters is the person inside. That's right. That's that. That that is very important message. So, how did you break the news to your son that he is from Bangladesh? He's uh, you have adopted him about his uh, biological mother or about Bangladesh? I I always waited until I thought they were old enough to understand and to not take it personally, you know, to not think, oh, I'm less now than I thought I was before, you know, which wouldn't make sense. And I don't remember exactly, but maybe they were 12 or 14. But I would I would just explain that this is the reality of it. And uh, as far as I know, uh, it wasn't a, that big a deal. You know, it, was, it wasn't their fault after all, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so when you mentioned about those things or shared the story that, uh, how did he feel? Did you see or observe any anything specific? No, I, I think he was okay. I think I, I always tried to put things in a very positive way, you know, things like that. And I think he knew that that was just how it was and that he was fine. He had an, a mother and father and uh, he knew that he was loved and that was kind of way off in the distance and he i don't think he could relate to it all that much okay has he visited bangladesh later on of, after you no, know hearing no, the story I asked him, yeah no i asked him but he said he wasn't interested so okay because he 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 is his whole life is in canada so he doesn't have any Canadian, yeah. yeah he's, he's very canadian that yeah. way yeah yeah okay Okay, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, we'll come to you again. But uh, let me just uh, uh, bring Mr. Mustafa on camera. So, Mr. Mustafa, I would like to ask you that, you know, how did you feel capturing those emotions, those, you know, memories and facts? It's not that easy, I understand, because I worked uh, uh, on something which is quite similar to that. So getting stories from people which are very personal is quite difficult. So did you, f you know, find any difficulties in Canada, whether it is a bumpy ride or not, if you share something about that? Yes, I, I certainly will. But before that, if I can just add to what uh, Liz was saying, uh, there's two things. Um, there are a couple of things I just want to clarify, and perhaps it's important that uh, uh, there are a lot of problems here in Ontario, actually. The federal government, which is responsible for immigration, was very friendly and cooperative. But in Ontario, Betty um, Graham was the director of child welfare or organization, and she was opposed to interracial adoption, and she did everything she could. But uh, Helka Ferry, who was one of the adoptive parents, she went on a hunger strike and finally it was uh, approved. Otherwise, it was very difficult. So there was a lot of uh, uh, 
objection from one person but not the government, Ontario government, but one person in the Ontario government. It was very difficult. So it was one thing, but the federal government was very friendly. That's one thing. And the other point that um, uh, Liz, uh, Liz, perhaps you, you, you're, you, it's, it's been so long, but I do remember talking to um, Anil several times and he told me how close he feels to be to his parents. He said the, the, the minute I opened my eyes, the only parents I saw are the parents who are raising me. So this is the only parents I have. I have no memory of, uh, of, of my mother, birth mother. And when I asked him, I asked him a question, uh, how would you, what would be your reaction if you meet your mother? And then he said, do you mean my biological mother? Because I only have one mother who's his mom. Uh, so I said, yes, your biological mother. So see, he, in his mind, he makes a difference. The mother who raised me is the mother. Um, so I said, yes, if you meet your biological mother, what would be your reaction? Then he said something that's really struck me forever. He, he answered me in three syllables. He said, first of all, I would say I'm very sorry to her. I would say, why would you be sorry? Well, I'll be very sorry for the way in which you conceived me. The way in which you conceived me, I'm very sorry. And then I would thank her. I said, why would you thank her? I said, I would thank her for not terminating my life. Because he knows that a lot of the um, uh, rape victims had gone through abortion and uh, terminated the baby. So he said, I would thank her for not terminating like, my life. And then I said, I'm, I will tell her that I'm sure you are happy. I said, how would you would that be? He said, because uh, you, you gave me up in the hope that somebody would adopt me. And yes, the couple who adopted me love me so much that I do not see the difference. And that's why I'm very happy. And I'm sure you will be happy because I am happy. And he told me that. And that was a spontaneous answer. I we mean, I over dinner. So like, you know, you can imagine the love that you got from the family that was adopted. He never felt that he was different. And um, I did ask him about that. Um, you, you may not recall now, it's been so many years, Liz, about how he came to know about it. He said he had this question because he often thought that he wished he had different kind of scheme like his parents, but he didn't have. But he had this awareness that he's different, but he never felt that he was treated differently. So he said, when I was growing up as a teenager, I had a lot of issues. But they had nothing to do with being adopted. That as a teenager, I had a lot of issues, but they had nothing to do with adoption. You know, then I had friends who'd come and defend me. And there's a lot of bullying going on at school at that time uh, because of race and everything. But he said I had good friends, and they would be white friends. So I never, I never experienced that. But more importantly, that the parents that I had, they gave me so much love, and I never had any chance to think about otherwise. You know, this is very important. And then he talks about his, his siblings and how close they are. And and um, Liz, if you remember, you did tell me that every year you used to have two birthdays, one for the baby's actual birthday and one the day they arrived in your family. You used to have that. Uh, so you'd have two birthdays, one is the day. And one of the girls you adopted from Toronto, uh, one of the girls of boys, and uh, he only came by road. Uh, so uh, he was sort of kind of kind of mad that he didn't fly to Canada, but she had to come from Toronto from another place. Um, that was one of the stories when, when they were growing up, but they're very close to each other. So the, the family that you had, and you also talked about the struggle that you did. Uh, and I remember you got that award as the best mother taking care of children. I think we have a photograph of that, that she was uh, in one of the neighborhood newspapers that it took called you a super lady, you know, the lady who can uh, kind of bionic women who can do all kinds of stuff, raising four children, you yeah. know, yeah. single handedly. Yeah. That was interesting. But anyway, I just wanted to add that. So no. I'll go back to your answer. Could you give me the question again? I'm sorry. Okay, but before going into that again, thank you very much for sharing that stories. Unfortunately, we do not have that picture that, you know, you are saying that she is a, you know, we are talking about Elizabeth, that she is a super mom. She is an, yes. you know, so unfortunately, we can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I think you have no it problem. Before. No problem. But the story you shared that the way they have been raised in a very positive environment that has given them a you know different kind of vibe. And thank you very much for that. And it is definitely the pitching they have got from their parents, like Elizabeth. So that has made them that strong. 
Thank you yeah. very much for that, uh, Elizabeth. I just wanted to ask you. I was asking you, Ms. Uh, Mustafa, that um, that you know this is a very sensitive issue, very personal issue. Mm -hmm. So while you are collecting informations or doing your research, whether you find any difficulties in Toronto with the families, because I don't know whether they were quite willing to share the stories, whether you know. So what was your experience like? It was initial. It was very difficult when I in those days you didn't have internet, so I had to call to tell. Like I was uh, collecting, I collected the phone numbers and called them and introduced myself. It took a while to introduce myself and explain what I was trying to do, what I'm trying to do. Uh, with some, it was very difficult, but I was traveling at that time because I was working for the government. So I would visit them and explain to them my written. I've written uh, quite a bit on. Uh, war babies and on uh, children of mixed marriage and I showed the parents, the adoptive parents and they kind of liked it and they took me in at that time. It's only after I established a good cordial relationship that they kind of uh, let me access the materials that they had. Uh, but it was for me a learning curve also because one of the couples, uh, the Cappuccinos, who adopted 20, who have 21 kids, two of them are biological and the rest are adopted. Uh, I I asked uh, Bonnie Cappuccino a question when I was I asked the same question pretty well everywhere, uh, but she was offended. And the question was, and I asked very naively, "How many are your own children?" And she said, "Mustafa, I'm offended. Mm -hmm. They're all my children. Some are biological, yeah. some are not. Um, so in the realm of adoption, you don't ask this question." For me, it was a learning curve. Like I went home and. Uh, and promise that never do I ask this question again. So I would ask how many. I, I think the same happened to me when I, I was just talking to Elizabeth. I said war babies. Then she said that babies are babies. War yeah. doesn't, you know, yeah. matter that uh, they are not to be blamed for the war or anything. Babies yeah. are and always babies. Yeah. You don't ask. And, and it was a learning curve for me. And I learned that you don't ask this question. It is true. And then another difficulty I had to ask uh, was... Um, whether or not they're, they're uh, uh, childless. Like, you know, you have the myth that people let up because they're, they're childless, they can't have children. Uh, yeah. This is a question that you can't ask, uh, but I had to find that information. So this was something, and I just asked another couple uh, to write about it, and she said, well, you know, if, if, if I have to write, I would write it. I don't want you to write my story. I said, this is such a success story. Let me share it with others. Well, you know, Mustafa, thank you. I would write my own story. You know, so and then the, look at the difficulty. And then another lady I asked her, uh, she was talking to me how difficult it was in the time length that, that they had to wait for to get the paperwork done. She said it was like a labor pain that I was going through, adoptive pain, labor pain. And then I said, Well, then he said, Good, I'm glad that you said that to me. She said, No, no, this is not for your book, this is just for you. <laughs> this is not for your book. So I pretty well had to talk to everyone to see what I, if I, and what I write, I would share it with you. And then I would, if it's a sensitive question. Yeah. So th these are very difficult uh, issues that I had to write and rewrite and talk about it. And the same thing about you know, the war babies themselves, their relationship with their sibling, relationship with their parents, because parents are racially different. You know, they don't see it that way because they live in the same house. It's multiracial. They grew up together, knowing them to their parents. Um, and yet there's, one or two, they are interested in one others have gone back three times and they want to know, find out more about it. Whereas some would be very indifferent, not disrespectful, but indifferent. There's just no lack of interest. Yeah. There's no interest in that. You know? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. As you yes. said that the whole process, the adoption process was not that easy. So you had, uh, you took the trouble of, you know, traveling to Bangladesh from Canada in that yeah. 1972. So... I just like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Mustafa, and if you also like to contribute, it would be better that, uh, you know, what was uh, the bilateral relationship between uh, Bangladesh and Canada at that time? How the government or the bureaucracy helped you or whether they, you know, give you difficult time? Right. Well, let me tell you, Bangladesh was recognized by Canada. Uh, in 1972, on 14th of February, uh, Bongo Bandhu came to Bangladesh in, on January 10th, 1972. As soon as he came in, he was brought up to the place by saying what has been happening. Before that, 
Mother Teresa came to Bangladesh on December 21st to find out about the war babies who were being poor and, and, and uh, abandoned. So she took a position that she would like to take care of them. Uh, that she went to see the, the, the acting prime minister of Bangladesh and he was given uh, he, he, she was given carte blanche to, to decide what is good for the babies, then the, the government will give them a hand. But uh, socially, they were so neglected that they were not accepted at all. So birth mothers, uh, birth mothers who are giving up their babies because the babies were called unwanted babies then in, in the newspapers and they were called enemy children. You know, they were branded differently. In any way, birth mothers was, was busy trying to hide her face because it was such a social stigma. And the problem was getting out of hand, control, because of the way in which they were abandoned. The government set up a few reception centers where they encouraged victims, rape victims, to come in and give birth secretly in confidence. And if they don't want the baby, the babies would be adopted. At that time, people heard about it, and the Canadian team heard about that, and then started to write to the government. Government was very receptive, but there was no adoption law in Bangladesh. The only law that is available it was Islamic law. It was due its date back to Cornwallis. It's called Guardian Act. You become the guardian of a child, and when the child becomes 18, it reaches the age of majority, then you cease to be the guardian. However, for parents to adopt from outside of Bangladesh, there have to be permission, and there has to be an act. So the government um, was interested in enacting an act and a new legislation, and the cabinet was in full agreement so they were able to do that very quickly but the canadian team went in july but the actual act didn't come out until proclamation until october but on good faith because the canadian team was very genuine and interested the government did make an exception bend over the backwards to allow them to kids so it's a precedent record setting record that the government allowed the couples now in the process in order to adopt there has to be a provincial government's clearance. In other words, people like Liz, they have to have permission from the provincial government that they're good parents that they would be adopted because there's a lot of trafficking going was going on at that time and it good does go everywhere. So that's just so that the child is adopted genuinely, they have to have that certificate. They call it homestead clearance. So once that was given, the team took it to Bangladesh government, Bangladesh reviewed it and then Sister uh, Margaret Mary, who was the statutory guardian of the, she looked at each file and she, they were given the babies to the Capuchinos and Capuchinos took babies on behalf of others. So there are 15 babies who are available at that time. There are a few more that are supposed to be coming, but they ended up dying because they were very frail babies. Um, uh, I think Liz Greedy probably witnessed one baby died in front of you, we were taking care of it. Um, so, uh, so that was a very difficult time at that time, there's no law. So once the law was developed, then they were able to declare these babies as abandoned babies. To be adopted, you have to be abandoned officially. So once they're abandoned, then they get. But the government was very strict and very interesting thing is that government developed also a policy that once a child is adopted, so one of the conditions is that when the child is grown up to be 18, he has to be given citizenship of that country. In other words, once they're in Canada, the Canadian government will have to give them citizenship of Canada. So that, and Bangladesh government monitored that. The, the, the team leader, um, Fred Cappuccino used to receive letters from Bangladesh missionary to find out how the children are doing. And for first few years, they used to receive uh, a report stating how the babies are doing because, so just want to make sure that the babies are not being abused and it's not. So it was, it was a, basically the credit goes to Bangla Bandhu. Uh, he developed that legislation. He had it developed and it was able to take to, so the Canada is, um, actually on record to be the first country in the world to take these babies, 15 babies. And Liz is fortunate to be she a part of that, right? From the from yeah. the from Dhaka yeah. to uh, to Montreal. You know, okay. so that's a that's a history. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You are very much uh, Elizabeth, you are very much part of our history, our liberation, our, our <laughs> independence history. So I would like to ask you that one important thing about um, it is not only that you need uh, need to adopt a child or children. You said that uh, your preference was about hard to place children. 
may i ask you why do you make that choice that you know hard to place children what inspires you uh, it's very easy for me and i think most women to love a very young baby you know it, it's not a, it's not difficult <laughs> And um, so if you feel that way towards babies, why not take babies that really, really need a home? You know, to me, that was always um, at the top of the list. Yeah, thank you. I think, it, yeah. It was, it, my parents were also very open-minded. Uh, my parents spoke six languages fluently, reading and writing, Russian, Estonian, Dutch, German. Anyway, uh, so I grew up with um, a very open feeling towards all different people. And to me, a skin color was just like nonsense, you know, like, what? That's the big deal, you know? <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I think we have a lot more uh, to learn from you. So being an adoptive parents, do you have any specific lessons uh, in your life that you like to share with us or our audience? When I, when I took uh, the kids to the grocery store, I had all four of them in the cart, in the grocery cart when they were little. And the question I got uh, quite regularly was, do they all get along? <laughs> 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 and it's, it was made me laugh so hard because they're brothers and sisters, you know? And I, and I, I almost said no, because they, they get along just like brothers and sisters do. But um, I said, well, yeah, well, you know, in their own, in each other's eyes, they just look like our brothers and sisters. So I hope, I hope maybe I, I taught people a little bit there. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, definitely. That definitely. always made me laugh, you know. Yeah. yeah. We will wrap up our program very soon. Sure, but before sure. that, so I'd like to ask you another uh, aspect of the whole story that what is your plan that uh, or whether they have any specific plan in future, your kids? including O'Neill? Plan. Oh, yeah, God. the future plan. My, my About plan, the life. My plan is uh, to stay retired and to enjoy life. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> That's really it, you know. And let me ask you the same question, you know, whether now they are grown up, whether they are getting along well with, uh, you know, each other oh, at this yeah. age. Yeah, there's no problem. Okay, okay, that's great. That's great. And I think probably the all credit goes to you, the way you have raised your kids, the, yeah, the lesson well, they have learned yes, from maybe, you. Maybe some, maybe some, but there's also, I believe, um, there's people are built differently, you know. And O'Neill was always a caring, sensitive person. Yeah. And uh, some people are... Are, are just not quite as sensitive, you know? And the fact that he was worried about his birth mother, that it, that speaks of who, how he was his whole life. He was always concerned for others. He was very sensitive to other people's needs. And maybe some of that came from me, but, I, but my other kids are not quite like that, you know? So I think some of it is really um, inborn. It's how, it's how people are built. And I'm sure not everybody from Bangladesh is like that either, you know, but some people are, right? That's right. That's right. I think in the, in the same family, you know, the sibling, they have different kind of characters, exactly. different kind of things. Yeah, yeah exactly. Though that's they raise in the same environment, yeah. the same parents. Yeah. yeah, I agree. So, yeah, thank you very much, Elizabeth. And thank you very much, uh, Mustafa Chaudhary. Mustafa, if you, uh, if you have any specific thing, yes. last word to share. Yes, I'd like to. I would like to two uh, two quick points, basically related to to what um, Liz was saying. Uh, Liz, if you recall, you were talking about Anil's eyes. If you recall, you told me. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, talking yeah. about his eyes. If you if you recall, when you were at the the Shishu Bhavan, the missionaries of charity, you took him on your palm and you looked at him, and you saw something in his eyes, yeah, and you yeah. said you thought that he's telling that he needs a mom. And you said to yourself, I I am the mother. No, no, I didn't think he, he was telling me he needed a mom. I thought he was from a very highly evolved um, place. He had eyes like uh, a spiritual teacher. Yeah, and you, you said something like, uh, I would like to be the mother. Right? Oh, yeah, as soon as I saw the eyes. Yeah. And, he, he, and, and also because he was so skinny, I think I also was more attracted to make sure he was going to be okay. But yeah. the other kids had more 
normal eyes, but his eyes were just very, very deep and wise. Deep yes. and wise, I would say. Told that, and yeah. I, I am the mom. I would like to be the mom. He said something. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. But yeah, he, he, he wasn't. He wasn't begging for anything. But but I was uh, pulled in. Yes. <laughs> yes. That one thing. And another thing about his name. If you recall, yeah. Neil told me too. His name is O'Neill, O N I L O'Neill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Name. But often in Canada, many used to call him O'Neill. O'Neill is an yeah, Irish yeah, name. Yeah. O yeah, apostrophe yeah. and yeah. 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 So when they call him O'Neill, he doesn't like it. He told them. He corrects them. Yeah. He said, "Them look, my name is O'Neill." Yeah. And they said, "O'Neill." He said, "No, this is not. This is how it's spelled." I think it has to do with is start like the the. The name that was given in Bangladesh, his respect for the culture and the name. That, that's how I see it because yeah. otherwise it doesn't matter, yeah. O'Neill or O'Neill. But because the name yeah. in Bangladesh, he, he wants to respect yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I have that. a question about that because I was told by somebody that his name probably should have been Anil, A N I L, that that's a much more common Bengali name. And no. that the, the nurse who put it on the crib might have misspelled it. No, actually, I can correct it uh, as far as I know. It's in Bengali, it's O N I L, but when they emphasized it, that's they right. Anil A. Oh, okay. It's, and, actually, and, and, it's, like, it's like Ashok. Ashok is the, is the emperor, but when you write it in English, they write it with the A. Oh, so okay. it's the anglicized version of O'Neill, but actually, it's O'Neill, O N I L. Oh, good. Okay. But um, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you very much uh, on behalf of TV Metro Mail and as a Bangladeshi Canadian, uh, on behalf of people of Bangladesh, I would like to say thank you very much for raising so such lovely kids in Canada. I want to thank you because they made my life very positive. <laughs> uh, that, that this is how you see because you are a very positive person. That's why you, you see things in that way. Yeah. We hope that we all can see life in that way. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Uh, and Mr. Mustafa, thank you very much for your research, your work, your uh, book, uh, which has given us some kind of idea about uh, uh, some human uh, story as well with regard to our uh, children, the war uh, babies, those who are very close to our herd. Thank you very much for being with us. Take care and stay well. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.